Hey guys, we're here at LTX. We're technically pre-show right now, and uh, they're still setting up. We're at the booth for Akaba Cuckoo. Yep, Akaba right? Cuckoo. Yep. Okay, and we'll link that below. So that's your YouTube channel. Yes. And you've got a whole retro hardware setup here. I do. Yeah. So yeah. there's there's some really cool stuff. We're gonna we're gonna walk through it, and I guess you can hopefully educate me on some of it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, and a lot of it's kind of historically significant too. So we can take a look at that. Before that, this video is brought to you by NordVPN. NordVPN is what we use internally as our virtual private network solution. We use NordVPN for international travel to bypass firewalls and at home for data privacy, especially from snooping internet service providers. NordVPN helps secure and protect your network privacy and is currently offering 75% off of a three-year plan with one month free. Claim the offer at nordvpn.com slash gamersnexus and use code gamersnexus at checkout or click the link in the description below. You have this booth set up. Yes. It's, it's fairly large. You've got 70s, there's 80s over there. I see... Uh, 90s. 90s. Kind of high. Yeah. <laughs> and then 2000s. Right. So let's, let's start. I guess let's start here. So yeah, so 70s. Um, the Commodore PET is one of three computers released in 1977 uh, that was dubbed the Holy Trinity or the Trinity okay. uh, for computers, uh, along with the Apple II and the uh, TRS-80 Model 1. I do not have one of those, okay. so it's not represented here. But uh, the Apple uh, or the Commodore PET is uh, pretty interesting because it's an all-in-one system. Uh, that The original version had a keyboard about that big uh. that had a square layout for the keys. It was terrible, had a cassette drive built in. This is the successor to it um, mm. from 1980. I like um, the, the, the first thing any programming class will ever teach. Yep. Print hello, you know, hello yeah, world. Yeah, do yeah. some basic math. Yeah. Y yep. Uh, that, that, yeah, it's just running basic right now. Uh, the, of the several things that kind of went awry during this setup. Uh, I forgot the disc with the game oh, okay. on it that I was gonna run at home. So I have a cassette with another game uh, that I might run while I'm here. So I'm thinking about doing that. Okay, uh, so how does this setup work? Is this, an so, was this an accessory or was it sold with it? So this was an accessory um, for the uh, pet. You could get it with or without because you could also use the disc drive. Um, so this plugs into a dedicated cassette port. Okay. Um, and this is pretty standard for most of the Commodore's uh, computers, the VIC-20 or the C64. There was actually a different version of this one that would have come with the PET. Um, so for these, you take out the uh, cassette and then there's different labels on it that tell you, um, in this case, what system the game you're loading for is on. So it would be on the back for this one. So you'd have to put it in and then you would have to rewind or fast oh, forward yeah, yeah. to the position that you need to for this right. one then you'd run a uh, load on here and it would tell you to press start on the cassette and you can just press play and then it will load the data. And it sounds like receiving a fax, it's scratchy digital audio. Matter of fact, I have one here um, that I can play. So how did you, how did you, oh nice. How did you come into ownership of all this stuff? Uh, many years of looking for all of it. Um, Mostly on, eBay or? Uh, no, I, well, eBay's expensive. Okay. <laughs> so I do a Craigslist, look for okay. the stuff locally. Uh, people who are trying to get out of the hardware, you know, um, sometimes have a good deal, sometimes not, you know. Right. But usually locally, because shipping can be really dangerous for these things too. So yeah, uh, yeah, I try to get everything locally if I can. Very cool. Uh, so, so we looked at the Commodore. Yep. And then... So Apple II, this is actually the last version of the Apple II, it's a 2E Platinum. Um, this has the keyboard that was reminiscent of the 2GS, if I remember correctly. Um, so this computer is actually interesting. Um, the Apple II line was the first line of computers for the home market that could use add-in cards. Yeah. But right. to do anything with a computer, you need a card. You want a disk drive, you need ah. a card. You want stereo sound, you need a card. Okay. You want uh, expand better video, you need a card. In this case, it comes with the card. But so yeah, it's it's nice that you can upgrade it, but you have to upgrade it right, <laughs> to right. be useful. So okay. What's um, the next one? Atari. So, so this is an Atari 400. Um, this is actually very similar technologically to the Atari 5200 game console. Yeah, um, I, it, have, I have a 5200. Yeah, inside it's almost exactly the same uh, electrically. So what they did is they took the 2600 and they upgraded it and then they created two versions. So the Atari 400 here and the Atari 800. The 400 was directed towards kids to learn to use computers. And that's why it has this keyboard because it's meant to be spill proof. So this is a membrane oh, okay. keyboard. I know. It's not meant to be a serious business <laughs> okay. computer. Right. But uh, this is a, another system where you'd commonly load software off tape, 
but it can also do software off cartridge. So okay. you can do that. That's super easy to use. Uh, uh, yeah, it just works with the standard 2600 controllers and they can play some River Raid if right. you don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I like the I like the antenna you strapped on the top too. Oh yeah, I had to make the TV got, nice and showy. Yeah, it's got to be a uh, got to be genuine, right? Oh be, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, for the most part, it's wood grains. It's fake. It's from 1992, if I remember right. Okay. It's, it's just looking old. <laughs> All right. Um, then I have some computer peripherals and hardware. Um, so this is an IBM Wheelwriter typewriter. Um, this one's interesting because it can actually be used as a printer. Okay. So it's a typewriter that you could use as a printer if you didn't want to also buy a printer like this. Right. So uh, it's, this typewriter in particular has an interesting callback to, a uh, printer has an interesting callback to typewriters and it uses spools of ribbon like old typewriters did. So in I'm the- I'm still curious if, this is just reminding me of, uh, even up through the 90s, mm -hmm. the, the beige color scheme for yes. everything. Yeah. Do, do you, is that ever? something you've ever looked into? Was there a specific reason? Was beige, was oh. it a trend or was it like that was the affordable pigment or whatever it, to use? It was mostly that white stuff kind of seemed higher end. So okay. that that was it. It's not, it's not really meant to be beige, um, ah. which the uh, <laughs> computer will look at towards the end over there. Um, it was built with all new components that were still sealed in the boxes ah, okay. and they are all originally white when okay. they came out and all this stuff looks yellowish so nowadays. So aged. Yeah, it's all of it's aged. Okay. The, the IBM one's looking pretty good though. Yeah, so um, IBM used in the typewriters and also in their Model M keyboards, um, a different kind of plastic formulation that doesn't have a chemical that does yellow. Okay. So what that is generally thought of is that it actually means that it's a little more um, likely to catch fire. Right. Because <laughs> it's blamed that it's a fire retardant molecule right, that right. does this. Well, that's the, so. the SNES over there reminded me of that too. Yes. There were yeah. some SNESs that had some yellow yes. uh, issues. And I think that was from a, re a fire retardant chemical yes. that they used. Yeah, yeah, it's usually blamed on bromine. Okay, so, yeah. interesting. Yeah, there are ways to reverse it, a process called retrobriting uh -huh. that uses um, a uh, advanced oxidation catalyst to do it. It's a it's a chemistry so is it process. Like a, you like paint it on or what? Well, there's different. You can paint it on. Um, that's using uh, usually OxyClean and uh, a hair gel for okay. bleaching hair. It has hydrogen peroxide in it. Is okay. the chemical component. Um, it's there's a lot of different ways you can do it though. You can also use ozone. You can use UV light. You can use heat. Okay. Um, it's it's complicated. There's a lot to it. Right, right. <laughs> so there's everyone's still trying to figure out the best way to do retrobriting to return this stuff back to the original colors. But there's also a fear that it damages the plastic, making yeah. it brittle right. um, after you do it. Then other people have the thought that the plastic is already brittle because it's aged. So it's it's hard to tell. Yeah. So this is a display I thought would be cool for people to see um, because most people maybe be used to DVDs or Blu-rays or CDs, but uh, I have all the way back to 360 kilobyte floppy disks nice. um, for <laughs> removable storage some zip disks for that. Uh, people have some fond memories of those being a little better than floppy disks. I'm actually right. using the uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy disk over somewhere else. I see some early so, hard drives too. Yeah, the hard drives. So um, I have everything from a 10 megabyte um, ST412. That was I think, one. I think the first hard drive ever was four, four megabytes. Well, there, there's, this is the first one that was in this form factor. Okay. Um, the, well, actually the 506 was the first one. That one was five megabytes, megabytes, okay. but they're nearly the same hardware wise. Um, Got it. So, it, but there were larger hard drives and then there were hard drives with removable platters and they, the platters could be up to like two and a half yeah. feet across. They I were saw massive. some of those at the, uh, have you been to the Mountain View um, Computer History Museum? I, I'm going to be going there yeah. next weekend because the Vintage Computer Festival is happening there. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm that's, gonna see that's that. worth, you'll, they have some of those uh, old dig hard drives. Yep. And there's a story that uh, one of the curators told us where the when when those discs failed, I guess when mm -hmm. the motors failed, mm -hmm. sometimes it would send the disc flying through the wall. Oh, like wow. into the next room over. Yeah. Because I guess the amount of weight you're dealing with at the RPM yep. you're dealing it's with. A big metal plate with a lot of inertia. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Makes kind sense. of fun fun history facts on oh, those. Oh yeah. What, uh, how about over here? So oh, over man. here. Starcraft caught so, my attention. So course. yeah, and Turok. I, I thought this would be fun for people to see what games take up space wise. So most yeah. people have Steam libraries nowadays. They don't go out and buy games. So this is 50 big box games and software. Yeah. Um, and just 
this is what it takes to store all this stuff. I, so. I still have my uh, box game collection and mm. I wish I could still buy them box. Yes. It, well, there are a couple that you can. We'll take a look at um, okay. some new releases that okay. are coming out in big boxes. Sure. Um, but yeah, that that's fun. I collect, I have, I think like 500 big box titles um, and that many again of the smaller box ones like this that come in DVD sizes. But yeah. have you ever uh, had the opportunity to speak with Richard Garriott? No, I'm not familiar with who that is. Oh, yeah, he made Ultima. Oh, Ultima wow, series. okay. Yeah. I was just looking at all this stuff and I, I think he would love this setup. <laughs> We've worked with him a few times and he's like, ah. he's he's quite the hardware historian himself, so. That's awesome. Yeah, Ultima guy. So what about uh, what about this stuff? So over here- um, I've seen some actual displays, like non-text displays now. Oh yes, we're getting into the realm of graphics. Right. So um, this computer has a, it's a CGA card, computer graphics adapter. Um, so it's monochrome because that's how this computer worked. It was a green uh, display, you can only show one color. So it's running a game pole position that was uh, made by Namco, it's pretty popular. Uh, this is a PC release. So is so, this the original price? Was 35.9? Yeah, that was the price in 1983, and that's the equivalent price it, with, with inflation, inflation nowadays. So yeah, nine grand. <laughs> but that was still cheaper than the IBM PC with the equivalent configuration. I just happened to have forgot the computer itself oh, okay. on the floor in my house, 1600 miles away. So <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can get one locally uh, for the event before it starts proper, but. So this one was uh, was three grand originally, yep. 1981. Yep. Oh, it's an Intel 8088. Yes, yes. Okay. So this is the computer that started the 8088 uh, yeah. trend and we're going to see a lot more x86 based hardware after this. 4.77 megahertz. Yep. And then we, we should mention this. We didn't mention this on camera yet. So you've got this rating here in the bottom right. Mm -hmm. Do you want to explain this? So I tried to track down the MIPS values for every CPU and every computer here. And I got uh, almost all of them. There's just one. We'll take a look at it. We, I don't have. Um, so this is what the MIPS would be. And this is a rough calculation um, because this computer actually had a math coprocessor that would do the floating point math that is usually oh, okay. uh, done for the MIPS evaluation. So this is just really rough. but. I can use that and compare it to modern processor MIPS right. and say just how much faster modern CPUs are compared to these older ones. So 9900K, roughly 253,000 times. times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> times the 8088 at 4.77 megahertz. Yep. Man, cool. So, what about, uh, so what's, what's, what's the next big one you uh, want to point out? All right, so uh, representing Compact Max is a Macintosh Classic 2 here. So this is actually from 1991, but most people associate this line of computers with the 80s. Um, I forget when the first one came out, so I'm not gonna have that little I like the mouse factoid. though. Yes, so the mouse is- I see Apple hasn't changed at all. Yes. One no. button. Yep, <laughs> yeah, this, that's the, I believe, uh, no, this isn't the uh, first mouse that came like that, no. The, the Lisa had that kind of mouse like that originally, okay. um, one button, yep. Have you ever seen the first, uh, this is also at that Computer History Museum, mm -hmm. the first mouse that was made? Oh, no, I haven't. It's, it's a wood block with mm. a red button on it yeah. and a cord, <laughs> and like that's the mouse. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I, had, I am looking forward to seeing that stuff. Uh, I know they have a Xerox Alto, which is one yes. of the first graphic they operating do. system uh, computers, so I'm excited to see they that. They also have a Babbage machine, the oh. 1800s, I think, yes. computer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if we want, I have a mechanical calculator over there oh, as dear. well. Yeah, so, let's look at that. So let's... this is an entire display of calculators. So uh, I have different generations of calculators here. Oh, they, Casio, yeah. Yeah, they started out as desktop units uh, for the most part. So this is a pure mechanical calculator. Um, it has two registers that numbers are stored in. So you have an invisible upper register. And as you type in, you can only see that this uh, is advancing because you can't see what numbers are being typed in. We push the plunger and it adds that number to the bottom register. Okay. So you can see what's going on. And with this, you can also do uh, more clever stuff. This um, is a good representation of how a CPU works. Too. It really is. Because it's the same thing where you're dealing with registers. You fill the registers and then you have to eventually purge them or yeah. do something with the data. Yeah. yeah, and this it's also kind of funny because every single operation this can do is based on addition. So let's say you want to do five times five, you're going to hold that uh, key down, you're going to push the plunger and you're going to watch this black digit count up to five. 
And then once it's done it five times, you know your answer is 25. And all it's doing is just adding the five okay. over and over again. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Do you know yeah. when that came out? That is 1957. Oh, okay. Cool. So there were mechanical calculators before then. This was actually towards the end of it. It's just kind of cool that it has a traditional keypad um, because other older calculators had a grid of numbers. It's got a very uh, haptic response too. Yes, that as well. So this one is from 1977. It's the last version in a line of calculators that started in 1959. This does not have a CPU. It is discrete transistor logic. Oh, cool. <laughs> are those vacuum tubes? Th those are Nixie tubes. Okay. So. Can you Each. educate me on the difference? Okay, so a vacuum, these are vacuum fluorescent uh, display tubes. Okay. So these have segments, all right? So uh, that's VFD. I see. Um, it's a flat plane, there's a grid, and then there's different areas that so get seven excited. Segment. Yeah, it's a seven segment. Okay. Yeah. Um, this, uh, for each individual number you want, there is a layer of a filament. Oh, one after another, and they're in a different order. Oh, that's why that looks like there's a different yep. depth to yep. each number? There's different ah, depths okay. because they're all in a stack. That's now, pretty clever. Yeah. Now, they're not uh, done in the order of, uh, you know, greatest to, or lowest to highest. They're done in an order to where they won't damage each other because okay. the longer you leave Nixie tubes on, they sputter material around them, and you can actually darken the numbers. Okay. So. There's a process you can do where you overvolt them to try and burn it off and make it brighter again, but it's risky. So, okay, cool. Yeah, so that one's 1973, um, has discrete logic. Um, and like I said, it's the last in a line like that. This is 1972 and has a really early uh, all-in-one calculator IC. I so, okay. yeah, that that's the size difference between discrete yes. and uh, CPU versions. Right, so. integrated circuits. Yep. revolutionary yeah. yeah they were magic and then after that it was just a stone throw before they started making all the calculators portable because once it was one cpu it was super easy yeah so here's a uh tandy or radio shack uh color computer three the last version of the color computers and it was just a, a simple machine that ran basic used cartridges for games had game controller ports but people really liked using it so it got a ton of accessories for everything you could ever want to do. So a disk drive and you need a disk drive controller. It has a stereo sound card add-on that you can get. There's printers, this one uses thermal paper. Um, you could load software off cassette as well. So this is kind of like dongle life in 1980. Yeah, right. <laughs> you need all this stuff taking up space just to use it as a regular computer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, with the, the trackball mouse too, oh, is that what that it's, is? It's a game controller. Oh, it's a game controller, yeah. okay. So it's actually kind of horrible if we start the game up um, it doesn't stop you from going in one uh, direction. So you have to keep <laughs> trying to fight it to go the other direction. It is not a very well designed. That's a very, designed. Un very unique type of skill you need to yes. be good at that. Yeah. Okay, what's next, HP? All right. This is an HP computer. Um, this is part of their Series 80s line of computers. So this has a custom processor that they designed that runs at, what is it, 0.6 one three megahertz okay. so it's a kilohertz speed processor right. but it works by doing so many instructions per cycle to get its speed up that it's actually somewhat uh, comparable to other processors at the okay. time but uh, this uses um, all, all proprietary hardware everything it's really hard to find anything for this sucker uh, but it, it's super cool it has built-in graphics unlike a lot of those earlier computers um, it's meant to do like plots of data that you've yeah, collected. Yeah. Um, you can use external modules to collect data directly on the computer. Okay. So yeah, it's, this is a science and engineering computer um, from 1982. So <laughs> yeah, that one's one of my favorite computers just because I'm a big nerd. And HP is still around too. Yeah. They, they survived. Yep. Yeah. I after this, they bought out Compaq, who made that portable computer. It's kind of like the, the early car industry too, where yeah. you start out with hundreds of companies and whittle it down to just maybe like five big ones or something. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of that. But HP almost bought Apple. Um, Steve Wozniak had offered to sell HP Apple when he worked there, but they didn't want it. So they oh. signed a release telling him he was free to go do whatever he wanted with it. Oh, that was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Right. On, the, on the list of big blunders, yeah. Yeah. I hear the Doom music. Oh yeah, so here we have a 486 DX100. This is actually a overdrive. With some pretty sick speaker setup too. Yeah, so this is a uh, realistic uh, amplifier. It's a bookshelf speaker set with some Minimus 7W speakers. Just 
thought it would be a nice little yeah. setup to have. Um, I have with this for the music, the Roland sound, sound modules uh, that were used to design the music for the games. So oh, the games okay. were kind of meant to have this music always, but they had to use the sound blasters and ad libs and all the sound cards that computers would have generally. So this is how the music is meant to sound. And most of the time when you played at home with your less expensive setup, yeah. it wouldn't sound quite as good. So this is the authentic, correct setup for that. Cool. Oh. This is a 94 setup and let's see, quick spec. So 100, uh, 100 megahertz for the processor. Yep. And your comparative, if we go by your comparative metric here from earlier, we're getting closer now. Yep, much closer. So 9900K is only about 8,000 times more powerful, which is <laughs> yeah. not, it's a big number, but it's not nearly the 200,000 times we saw earlier. No, no, no. Technology was rapidly developing in yes. the late 80s and early 90s. Yeah. 20 megabytes of RAM as well. Yep. Okay, not it, bad. It could have more, but you know, there's no real point because DOS software it couldn't do anything with it. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. So what's so. next? Up next, we have a dead computer. Oh, I want to um, point this out too. Oh, yeah. So I like how tactile everything is. Yes. Here. So giant flip uh, style power switch, a uh, turbo button, where if I do the game here, you can see it's running nice and smooth. And then I turbo down and it chugs. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> So what are you going from 33 to? to uh, 33 megahertz uh -huh. to 100 megahertz, but it's only three digits, so I made it right, 99. Right, right. Well, so is it is it basically like a pre-overclock button, or what's uh, what's going on so actually? It, it um, if I remember correctly, it reduces access to cache for the CPU, so it takes longer to do operations. Okay. Um, this it, it's underclocking the processor. Okay, always. gotcha. So. Uh, it's a slight misconception about the turbo button. When you right. enable it, you actually make your computer slower. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. Uh, this, let's talk about this too. Yeah. So this is something um, I'm having difficulty getting set up here at the event, but this is a VR headset from, uh, I believe, 1995. It has two LCDs in the goggles that have uh, separate images that it will display and you get a full 3D effect. And yeah. In the back here, it actually has a head tracking unit as well. So as you look around, it can send actions to the game. Okay. So I have a game that would have been great for this, Descent 2, that yeah, is a, a full 3D spaceship flying game type thing. So yeah, hopefully I can get that going before the event because that's really fun. Uh, and then I'm going to have a flight stick and use WASD for moving around. But yeah. Yeah, that one's really cool. Uh, here we have two Windows 98 PCs. So. This one is a computer that I've had for many, many, many years, like 15 okay. years now set up and working. Um, this one is just some AMD Athlon XP. Um, wasn't really all that interesting. So I decided I wanted to build a new Windows 98 computer. And when I say new, I meant I found all the parts in the original boxes having never been used. That is, so, oh yeah, look at how nice that keyboard is yes. too. Yeah, so that is a Microsoft natural keyboard. That is, it was never used until I took it out of the box. Was it, it uh, are these things when they're new in box? Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that the seller is selling it to collectors, right? Like Essentially, yes. Yeah, so yeah. is the markup pretty high on that? Or? For new stuff, it depending on what it is, it can be radically higher. Okay. Like uh, the graphics card, the Voodoo 5 is not a cheap graphics card to get nowadays, yeah. but new sealed ones go for a lot more because they make good display pieces. Yeah, uh, exactly. They right. always had amazing box art. I'm I'm a little disappointed that modern graphics cards don't have the crazy box art now that the old AGP cards yeah. did. Yeah, this is an interesting little time capsule because you can see how this plastic has yellowed and this one is pristine white. Yeah. It's not doing anything. So. Yeah, now we're in the yeah. era where I was I was starting to play a lot of games at this point. Too. Oh yeah, and that's these are the computers that most of the games on that shelf over there run on. So this is the Sunflower iMac G4. Um, this is it's a, a very stylish computer. Um, it kind of sucks to work on though, as you can imagine. It's unlike a lot of Apple's computers that is not passively cooled. So there is a fan in there that's blowing air up. Okay. Um, but it has so many parts crammed in there. This is a full size DVD drive oh, man. in there. So it is tight, uh, yeah. but it's actually not that bad of a computer. It can play games pretty well. Uh, so yeah. It's, Price is pretty, it's nice. pretty competitive for the time. Yeah, it wasn't really wasn't that bad. So 
Apple's changed quite, <laughs> quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Sunflower, you said? Yeah, the sunflower is that because, just, it, because of the display on the looks. stock. Yeah. So, yeah. So now we're getting into 2000s. I think, you, did you say that LMG had mentioned they wanted a representation of yes, 2000s? Th yeah, they'd asked if I could add some 2000s stuff to the display yeah. as well, um, in addition to the 70s, 80s, and You're 90s. You're starting to get into so. stuff that not long after this, Linus was selling at NCIX. I know? imagine he was for this, because this is actually a QX9650 build. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, that sounds, sounds about right. That was at the tail end of the 2000s, so right. here we are. Um, he was big on the uh, acrylic panels, too. Yeah, I mean, that's what this has <laughs> on the side there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, but, I have this mount, MX5. 18? 518, yeah. 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 That and the G15, those were some. Oh, I've got that too. Primo yeah. mid 2000s oh, yeah. peripherals. I yeah. used this mouse all the way up until probably 2012 or 13. It's a great mouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's not surprising because they brought we, it back. We <laughs> talked to Logitech about um, about some of their older mice, like the G5s, MX5, uh, mm -hmm. 518. And they were telling us that the biggest problem they faced was their stuff was too good. Oh. It wasn't dying. Yeah. So then people wouldn't buy more. Oh, man. So it was an, an interesting challenge. Yeah. So the, the G15 is also kind of inter interesting because it's just a membrane keyboard. Right. The only thing that makes it a gaming keyboard is all the glitz on top of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got the G keys, the display. Yeah. Yeah. They still, uh, the G19 had another, was another one with a display too. Mm. And yes. then. So this system, Core 2 Extreme, and this was a three gigahertz processor. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our comparison now, so um, this is not obviously, a, we should we should have disclaimed this, uh, MIPS not a perfect comparison. No. <laughs> but I guess the reason you're using this is because you're comparing so many generations of hardware. Yeah. There's no single benchmark. There isn't, no. There's no PC mark for the Commodore PC. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, but if we go by that metric, you're now eight times. Yes. Which is pretty close. Yeah. So. This number, it actually is a rounding error. It's half of the, or this is, uh, the i5 is half as powerful as this. Oh, okay. So you'd be better with the QX9650. Okay. <laughs> with the MIPS system. Yeah, with yeah. MIPS, you know, right. with the issues that come with that. Right, right. Wow. Oh. And a GTX 260. Yeah. The display on this one's actually slightly interesting as well. It's a Dell UltraSharp uh, 2000WFPB, if I remember correctly. That was, it's 1920 uh, by 1200. Impressive memory, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this would be like the 5K monitor now for when this came out. Right. This thing rocked. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, so that's the tour. Yeah. Uh, this stuff is or was, depending on when the video goes up, all at LTX. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to see more of it, uh, your channel, Akabakuku. Akabakuku, and we'll link that below. Um, so I guess you do more of this type of stuff there? Yeah, vintage uh, computers, electronics, and different stuff. So. Cool. So check him out. And otherwise, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. We'll see you all next time.